Greetings, my brothers and my sisters, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we want to start our worship today through prayer, and uh, we will go into the message thereafter. Lord God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for being so merciful and kind to us, so gracious. Oh, Father, we thank you for just being a blessing to us all, even through this pandemic. Our numbers around the country are at full-blown scale now. Our president is acting uh, like I never thought I'd see him. I thought he was bad enough, but now we see evidence that it's even worse. But God, we just thank you to know that we can look to you. Look to the hills from whence cometh our help, knowing that our help cometh from the Lord that made the heavens and the earth which tells us that we shouldn't focus on man, no matter how how, build, how big he builds his celebrity, Lord, but uh, that we continue to keep our focus on you. God, we just thank you. The Lord knows that we love you. Oh God, we just ask that you continue to bless us. Bless all your, brother, all the, your children all over the world, Lord, that lift up the name of Jesus. Oh God, we pray for our brothers and sisters that are outside of the fold of your family who have not confessed Christ as Lord. And then Father, we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to guide us and lead us even through this maze of pandemic, even with the seriousness of, of it, Lord. We thank you for the election again, Lord. We pray for our churches, our missionaries, Lord, and God, we pray that the message that's being carried forward to the people, Lord, are a message that you have sanctioned, that a message that you have ordained and not from the minds of men. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless and keep us and that we and we ask, Lord, a special blessing on our folk at the in the Pocatello area. Well, we've also heard that the numbers are extremely high in Idaho now and they were doing so well earlier. So, Lord, but then, uh, you know, that Republican mindset of not wearing masks and not this social distancing has created this problem even to be more intensified now as we approach the Thanksgiving season uh, than it has been all year long since March, God. So, Lord, we pray your mercy now on these, your people. Oh, God, we pray that you would just use us to your glory. We pray for all the churches, those who you've placed in charge in those fellowships, Lord, those virtual churches as well. Bless them, continue to keep them, Lord, strengthen them, Lord. Let the word of God go forward to the people that their hearts may be satisfied thereby. And we'll be so sure to give you all praise, honor, and glory for it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. And we can say amen and amen. I've got a wonderful, I mean, absolutely wonderful, Holy Ghost filled surprise for you. I mean, this person is absolutely revolutionized gospel music today. And he's much younger than I am, but I call him my hero. Would you get up on your feet and clap your hands tonight for the Reverend Kirk Franklin?
living in a day and time where being politically correct is popular. Let me turn that around again. We're living in a day and time where everybody is saying the name of God. But nobody wants to say the name of Jesus. We don't want to offend the Muslims. We don't want to offend the Jews. We don't want to offend the Arabs. And so therefore we crucify him of flesh. But I want you to know that there will come a time when every Muslim, when every Buddhist, when every Jew will have to get down on their knees and have to confess that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall die. So I want every blood washed believer to not wait until then. And if you've ever gone through something, you know right here Tell us. that there's something about the name. Something, yeah. something about the name Jesus. Something about the name. Something about the name Jesus. It's the sweetest name. And it is the sweetest name. Sweetest name I know. I know. And I love that name. Oh, how I love the name Jesus. Yeah. Is the sweetest name. Whoa, now we're having some feed problems. Wow. Wow. That's uh, rather bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into my own personal music selection. And uh, since I was trying to feed off of YouTube and see if we can find something that uh, is appropriate. Wow, that's in, that's. You know, I'm going to tell y'all something. <laughs> I, I'm going to pass on something about the name Jesus because obviously that's not the one wanted, but we're going to go here. You know, there are songs we sang years ago that when you sing them now, the charismatics challenge us and say so you have no scripture for that song. Your song is not scripturally sound. But many of the songs that our forefathers sang were not based upon scripture. It was based out of experience. They experienced things and they went through things. And sometimes in the fields, I'm told, because I'm not that old. That that was a way they would signal one another. <laughs> Tell them how to meet each other at different places. How things could go for them. I just need to hear that in my ear that I can kind of get it. But sometimes after they worked all day. And they wanted to just meet together and have prayer. They would just tell each other, let's go down by the river. Let's go down by the river. There we go. Oh, let's go down.
in the field that day. And they didn't know where all those folks were going. And they would run to the door, wondering, where, where, where's everybody going? Everybody keep passing my house. Where they going? Somebody would give them a signal when they walked by the door. And they would look at them and tell them, Oh, I'm going down. down by the river. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry about the mess up in the music, but hey, it's kind of like church when you got a choir that don't know how to sing. The music always gets messed up, but sooner or later it starts sounding good. Amen. 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 Lord God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, now we come. Lord, we ask that you bless us in this word, Lord, that would be a blessing to these, your children. And God, we'll be so sure to give you all praise, honor, and glory for it's in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen, and amen, amen. We'd like for you, if you will, if you would turn to the third chapter of Acts, and I'm going to pull a, a nugget out here uh, in the 19th verse where it says, repent therefore and turn back. Uh, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Amen, amen. And I'm going to talk about for a few minutes this morning, time to change. Time to change. Amen. No doctrine in the Bible is more important than the doctrine of repentance. Uh, it is the gatekeeper of salvation. Before people can be reconciled to God through his son, Jesus Christ, they must experience repentance. The lame man at the beautiful gate who encountered Peter recognized that in order for things to change, he had to repent and confess that Jesus is Lord before he could walk on his own. And this also set up an opportunity for his fellow Jews to hear the truth about the power of God through Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. If you would just believe on Jesus, things will change. Amen. Amen. I know amen go there. Amen. Uh, the experience of David in Psalm 51 is a classic illustration of genuine repentance. 
One almost feels that they are intruding on a scene that is extremely private and personal. For David is writing in the agony of remorse and sorrow. He has faced sin in his life with all the veneers of human excuses stripped away. His soul is naked before God and he sees himself stained and distorted before his creator, crippled by his sin. We watch in breathless wonder as this helpless man deals with a problem that clearly has no human solution. For he is guilty of sins that put him beyond the remedy provided by the laws of his day. It is with stunned amazement that we watch David work through an experience that resulted uh, in cleansing of his soul and the restoration of peace and joy in his life. As we study the Psalm 51, we can plot David's journey down the highway to repentance. First and foremost, David had to realize his sin. We must realize our sin before it's too late. Moses wrote in Numbers 32 and 23, be sure your sin will find you out. Before we observe the, breath, the breakthrough in David's life, the moment when he came to realize his sin, let us set the stage historically. We look in on a court scene in Jerusalem with Israel's greatest king sitting on his throne. David had been divinely chosen and anointed for the task of being God's king to rule over his people, Israel. He had also become the nation's spiritual leader. God had promised him that his house would be established forever. God had blessed him, his kingdom had flourished, and his armies had soundly defeated Israel's enemies. But in the midst of all of this victory and luxury, David saw and wanted and took for himself the beautiful wife of Uriah. And any other king in the world would have done this without a whisper of blame on him. But David was Je Jehovah's anointed. Before the sordid story was over, murder was added to the picture as David had Uriah conveniently placed on the front line of battle so that he would be killed. Thus, adultery and murder clung like soot to David's soul. For almost a year, David endured the lashing of his conscience. But one day, the fearless prophet Nathan came with that brief but powerful story of the neighbor who had one sheep, which was stolen by the man with many. A dagger was thrust into David's soul when Nathan said, you are the man. There would be no story to tell if something marvelous had not happened. Instead of rejecting Nathan's hot words of accusation and ordering the prophet executed for his presumption, uh, the process was triggered that resulted in David's rising again. Someone has suggested that David's sin must have called for a great celebration in the devil's domain, for David must have been the one person in the entire world Satan longed to have in his clutches. And now this great man lay morally and spiritually trapped and bound and ruined. David, the spiritual leader of God's chosen people, was out of the fight. But then there's the agony of his turning. David's first reaction following the shock of Nathan's accusation was a cry for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, David cried. God is ever monitoring the channel on which people cry for mercy. 
and he sends instant relief when people call. I want you to note David's pattern of thought. His first move was to speak out before God his particular and specific acts of sin. This was strictly between David and God. He used three words to describe his sin. Transgression, which means rebellion, deliberately setting oneself against the will and law of God, a calculated sin of high treason against the sovereign of the universe, iniquity, that which distorts one's reason, and then sin, which simply means missing the mark or failure. Then David used three verbs of action indicating that he wanted God to do something for him that he could not do for himself. He said, blot out, wash me, cleanse me. Blot out means to erase from the record. Wash me indicates David's realization that his whole being was defiled and needed a divine scrubbing. And cleanse me reflects his desire to be absolutely clean inside and out. Following this cry of, for mercy, David sincerely confessed his sin. I acknowledge my transgressions, he said, and my sin is ever before me. Nathan had said, you are the man. Now David was saying, Lord, I am the man. He assumed all responsibility for his sin. He did not blame his ancestors or even Bathsheba as an accomplice in his sin. He declared that he and he alone was responsible for his sin. In verses 7 through 9, David prayed not only that he might be received into God's presence again, but that he might be fit for God's presence. As David bared his soul before God, he saw what a vile, sinful person that he had been. Now he wanted God to purify his whole sin, defiled being. He wanted God to sprinkle hyssop on him. Hyssop was an aromatic oil used to spray those who had leprosy or some other loathsome disease. Not only did the hyssop serve as a deodorizer, but sprinkling it was also a symbolic act whereby one was cleansed for God's presence. David reached the climax of his prayer, the end of his journey down the road of repentance, when he prayed for a new heart and a new life. In verse 10, David is saying, in essence, Lord, because of this terrible thing I have done, you must assume your role as creator again for me. I must have a new heart. I have damaged the old one beyond repair. The scars are too hideous. Do your work all over again and give me a new heart, O God. Here, David lays the foundation for the New Testament doctrine of the new birth. He recognizes the strategic importance of being born again. The heart must be a new one. David's mental, moral, and spiritual self must be renewed by the creative touch of God. But then there is the glory of being restored, a note of positive ringing assurance uh, appears in David's words, uh, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, according to verse 7. Speaking of the then known imagined purity, not its color. David's hope lay in the fact that God is a God who keeps his word and who is as good as his promises. When this hope dawns in a person's heart, Life begins, for this is a truth to live by and a truth to die by. 
What was the natural result of David's experience of repentance and forgiveness of sin? It was the same first impulse that every saved individual has to tell others about his glorious newly discovered remedy for soul sickness. Note again his assurance. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you, according to verse 13. David vowed that he would spend the rest of his life telling others about God's grace and urging sinners to come to the only source of life and cleansing. David would be an evangelist, a seeker of lost people, and an announcer of good news to those who languished in darkness and sin. And so, my brothers and my sisters, in closing this morning, as we sum it up, we find four ingredients constituted David's repentance. First of all, humiliation and abasement of pride. Contrition. He recognized that his guilt was driving him nuts. Confession and then transformation. The Holy Spirit convicts people and brings them to a state of humiliation, to an expression of contrition and to the point of confession. Then the grandest miracle of all transpires when, as a result of these preparatory experiences, they are transformed by the power of God. Amen. When, when, we, when we turn our lives over to Christ, when we give our lives to Christ, we are saying to God, it's okay, God, do what you do to my soul, to my being, to my person. Do what you do. And so we thank God for, first of all, the provision of Jesus Christ, who after taking on the sins of mankind, all mankind, before and after, died on the cross on Golgotha's hill. They buried him in a barred tomb. Three days laid he in that tomb. Peter tells us that he even went into Hades and restored the souls of those who had died before him. And then on that third day morning, he got up with all power in his hands. And to that, from that day to this, He's still saving the lost. He's still saving those who think there's no hope. He's still saving those who are on the brink of ending it all. He's still saving those who don't know how to climb out of the bottle. He's still saving those who don't know how to put down the needle. He's still saving those who have been overdosing on pills and bringing them back from the brink of death, eternal separation from God. And so my brothers and my sisters, I say to you today, receive him, receive him, accept what he's done, and he'll be so sure to, to deliver you from your peril because that's the kind of God we serve. And until next week, God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Hope to see the day
God bless you until next week. In Jesus' name, amen.